Bible speaks about enemies to the human being. During our synod that we just had, and I'd like to thank all of our pastors that have come from all over the world. And uh, in fact, I'd like all of our pastors that are here today to stand up, please. And I'd like us to just acknowledge you and welcome you. Pastor Franz from South Africa, God bless you. Good to have you here. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Greg is all the way from U UK. Pastor Brian from Kenya. We have pastors, well, pastors from everywhere. And uh, would you just applaud these people? They are your servants. You know, I'm so grateful to, to be able to serve so many great men and women of God. You are my champions. You're my heroes, and I love you so much. And I'm asking that God would continue to bless you and his hand to be mighty upon you, and that you'd be set up for success. I believe that this synod has set us on a new plane and a new direction, and I believe that his favor will come upon you and overtake you. And as pastors, I believe you're going to see the grace of God increase everything you lay your hands on. God spoke to me at action this year that 2011 would be the year of disorder and chaos throughout the world. I think we've seen that. But that judgment would begin in the house of God. That if we would, during the year of chaos, put our house in order, that by 2012 we would see an unprecedented blessing and unprecedented growth. I can see that already happening. 2012 will be your year. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless. I'm deeply concerned in the body of Christ that many Christians are failing and falling short of their callings and of who they are, and that they are so ready and so easily persuaded to hand over their authority to outside sources. They're willing to allow people to manipulate them, dominate them, or control them. They're willing to allow the devil to have control over their lives. They're willing to allow the things of this world to consume them. Christians. The Bible's very clear. The scriptures tell us that we have three enemies. The enemies of the Christian are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I'd like to talk to you about the world, the flesh, and the devil today, and how you can overcome them. Because God has given you weaponry. He says we are not ignorant of his devices. We're not ignorant of Satan's devices. And God has given you weaponry. God has given you tools to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. But if you don't know what the tools are, you may not be able to succeed in overcoming. The Bible is very clear that he said, blessed are those who overcome, for they will inherit the kingdom. They, and, and there's many things that you can inherit by overcoming. And you can read that in the book of Revelations. The first three chapters of Revelations talks about the churches of Laodicea and, and Sardis and Philadelphia and, and, and all those churches. Uh, and what would happen to those that overcome? Well, God wants you to be an overcomer. But it's like the person who looks into his toolbox and all he has is a hammer. If all you have is a hammer, pretty soon everything looks like a nail. And you have to understand that if the only tool you know in your, hand, in your toolbox is maybe prayer. Prayer is wonderful, but prayer is not the only thing God gave you. Maybe it's faith. Well, faith is wonderful, but faith isn't going to solve all your problems. Are you with me? God does not leave the problem solving to others. He leaves it to you. That's why you're here. God told me to come as a, a leader and to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. My job is not to deliver you. My job is to equip you to be delivered. My job is not to heal you, although God may heal you through me, but my job is to teach you how to walk in divine health and divine healing. But see, you're so ready, many Christians are so ready to hand over their responsibility to someone else. My job is not to prosper you. My job is to teach you the principles, the patterns of prosperity and blessing. And they're not easy. It's not magic. It's not run down and put $50 in the offering and expect $5,000 tomorrow. You see, sometimes we get these gimmicks and it's witchcraft. 
give me your $1,000 seed and I'll give you your $10,000 blessing. That's witchcraft. That's not true. Tap your neighbor. That is, it's, it's manipulation. Anytime you are manipulated, dominated, or controlled, it's witchcraft. And when witchcraft comes into the church, we're in trouble. I believe that we need to create points of contact. I believe I need to help you to come to a place that you can visualize, that you can say, I can do that. I'll give you an opportunity to have a breakthrough wall. I'll have you an opportunity to, to sow into something. I'll give you lots of opportunities to give your money. But it's not to manipulate your money. I don't need your money. God doesn't need your money. I'm not after your money. I'm after an opportunity for you to release faith, to get your faith moving so that you'll see things differently, act differently, and behave differently so that you'll be able to have the blessing of God rest upon you, upon your family, and break the poverty curse off the generations that you're suffering under. Africa suffers under a curse of poverty. That's because for generations, we gave our money to witch doctors, we gave our money to the uh, Nyangas, we gave our money to, 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 uh, uh, to the wrong places to find power, thinking that they would empower us and give us wealth. Well, I'm going to tell you something. If you don't break that in your generation, your children will suffer from it, just as you have. Deliverance has a lot more to do with what you know and what you do in obedience than what you do through some kind of a magic miracle. Hmm. I think we have too much emphasis on others, not enough emphasis on us. Hallelujah. So the world, the flesh, and the devil. Turn with me to James chapter 3 and verse 15. Let me describe it another way. In James chapter 3 and verse 15, it says this. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly sensual and devilish. For where you have envy, selfish ambition, you find disorder and every evil practice. Then it talks about the wisdom that's from above. Can I tell you something? You have the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world, the things of the world are earthly. The things of the flesh are sensual. And the things of the devil are devilish. The wisdom of this earth, the wisdom of this world is earthly, sensual, and devilish because it traffics in the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let me explain it this way. To be earthly, what does it mean to be earthly? What are the temptations of this world? When Jesus was describing the temptations of this world, he says it's the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust for other things. See, the cares of this world are the things that entice you that this world offers. This world seems to offer so many good things. And how many of you know that the enemy of best or the enemy of good is, or, or of, of great is good? Sometimes there are good things and they become deceptive to you. How, much, how many of you know that too much of a good thing is not a good thing? The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine wherein there is excess. See, God hates drunkenness on anything. Some people are drunk on pleasure. Some people are drunk on money. Some people get drunk on, on, on all kinds of the, the cares, the, the things that this earth, the, the things that this earth has to offer. The flesh is sensual. What does it mean, sensual? It's appealing to your senses. How many of you know that your flesh, your body, you can taste, touch, hear, smell, and, 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 and it's good to be able to do that. Thank God you can smell something. Thank God you can taste something. Thank God you can touch something. How many of you know it's good to be able to touch something and know that it's hot? <gasps> what if your hand didn't know that that hot plate was hot? Just burn right through. Oh, it didn't feel anything. No, you feel. 
And, and God gave you feelings, but I'll tell you what, when you're moved by your feelings, when your senses begin to dominate you, when you begin to titillate and begin to have your senses dominate you, that's when you have a problem. See, and today, people have their senses so charged. You know, you can't watch an old movie anymore because now you have to have something that is so powerful that it overwhelms you. You become emotive. Your emotions begin to be, and what you do is when your emotions get to a heightened state, you open yourself up to demonic activity. Even our witch doctors tell us that they cannot put a curse on somebody unless they can get you into fear or anger or guilt. Hello? So what does God want to do with this? And then of course the last is the devil, well, he is devilish. And you can tell the works of the devil, although today, sometimes we don't see the works of the devil so clearly because the devil appears as an angel of light. You see, you wouldn't know if you were deceived because if you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived or you wouldn't have been deceived. Does that make sense? Deceived people don't think they're deceived. They just are deceived, but they don't know they're deceived because if they knew they were deceived, they wouldn't be deceived. And if the, angel, if the devil comes as an angel of light and you think it's okay, that's, guess what? Then, you, then, then it's okay. And because you believe it's okay, it's okay. But that doesn't mean that it's okay with God. And it doesn't mean that you're not deceived. Look at one more verse of Scripture with me. Look at 1 John. Just to take a right turn there. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. I think the King James Version says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These are the things that constitute a man. Can I tell you something? The lust of the eyes has a lot to do with what you see in the world. With your eyes, you've enticed and you're enticed by this world. The lust of the flesh has a lot to do with your flesh craving the things of this world, craving the things that, that, that the enemy entices you with. And the pride of life, pride is the strength of sin. Pride is where the devil entraps you. He causes you to sin. You fall into a snare. The enemy holds you, not through the sin, but through the pride. I can't tell you how many countless people are bound in their sin because they will not confess it. How many countless people are bound in their sin because they'll not bring it to the light. Whatever's in darkness is in darkness. Whatever you bring to the light cannot be held by darkness because the light exposes it. If you are the children of light, then live in the light, walk in the light. But if you're a child of darkness, then continue to do your deeds in darkness. But light and darkness cannot work together. And it's time that the church takes responsibility. You cannot live in darkness and then come on Sunday and think you're going to get a deliverance so you can continue to live in darkness. I'm sorry. That is foolishness. That is ignorance. You cannot be stealing all week long and think God is going to bless you because you put an offering in the basket of stolen money on Sunday. You cannot run your organization as a CEO and know that you're doing it corruptly and think that God's going to bless your organization because you came to church on Sunday. And I don't care how many prophets prophesy blessing over you, it has very little to do with what God is prophesying. God may want that for you, but I'm going to tell you something, it has to do with your character. And if you will not change your character, God will wink at you for a while, God will look at you for a while, God will bless you because God is the God of all blessing, but there will come a time he'll say, that's enough. Now it's time to grow up. And when the body of Christ decides to take responsibility and grow up and become character-filled is the day that you'll see real power in the church. Amen. Until then, you're going to have manifestations without real power. The real power is in character, not in gifting. Many of you are gifted. Your gift is taking you to a place that your character cannot keep you. 
Hmm. Well, let's just talk about these three areas, the world. How do we overcome the world? See, the Bible's very clear. The world and its desires, its appetites, the earthly sensual, the, or the earthly drawings, the, the, the lust of the eyes. How do you overcome that? Well, the Bible gives us examples throughout the scriptures. In 1 John 5 and verse 4, it says, For everyone who is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Everybody say, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith, even our faith. See, faith is what overcomes the world. Now, the father of faith was Abraham. What made Abraham so powerful? Because contrary to what was common in the world, Abraham was able to obey God and believe God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. When he looked at what the world said about his body, that he was 90 years old, and he looked at Sarah, she was 99 years old, and there's no way to have kids, and God said, you're going to have a baby. He looked and he said, okay, hoping against hope, believing that what God said would be true, he believed the word of God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. By faith, he received a child, even though it was after the time of childbearing. And God said, I will honor the faith of that man because it was contrary to the way the world thinks. Some of you, you are so worldly, so carnal, that no matter what God says, you believe what the world says. Well, it's impossible. Why? Well, because some scientist said so. Yet, the scientist is only studying creation, and the creator said something different. See, remember when Lot and Abraham's servants were fighting, and there were, they had both grown so powerful that there wasn't room enough for their herds to be together? And so, Abraham by faith, went to Lot and said, hey, listen, let's stop fighting. He said, you choose what direction you want to go. And so Lot, being very worldly, being very earthly, said, I'm going to choose the good land by Sodom and Gomorrah, the fertile soils of Sodom and Gomorrah. I want to... And, 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 and Abraham said, you choose. If you choose to go left, I'll go right. If you choose to go right, I'll go left. He says, it doesn't matter. He says, you just choose whatever you want, Lot. He says, my trust is not in the fertility of the soil. My trust is not in what looks good. My trust is in the Lord. Amen. See, I have faith in God. See, some of you, you, you're fighting over stuff in this world. You think this world controls things. You think that your opportunity is in this world. I'm telling you, if you ever come to faith, your opportunities are in God. Amen. Some of you have, not, have stopped living by faith and you're living by the world system. Some of you run your businesses as though you're building them, not God. Tap your neighbor, say, I think he's talking about you. See, I have learned this. If, if, if I can see it, it's probably not faith. If I can do it, it's probably not faith. If I can accomplish it, it's probably not gonna require much faith. If I can already see the beginning and the end, and I know how to make it all happen, I probably don't need much faith. I'm probably being worldly. But it's when I can't see the end that I need to have faith. Let's just talk about the flesh for a minute. The flesh is sensual. It's the, it's the lust of the flesh. Your flesh lusts after things. How do we overcome the flesh? Well, you can read Romans chapter 8. I don't have time to do it. But the Bible talks about the flesh is at enmity against the spirit. The spirit and the flesh war against each other. As many as are led by the spirit, they're the mature sons of God. The spirit begets spirit. The flesh begets flesh. You see, 
spiritual people understand that the way to overcome the flesh is to be led by the Spirit. You have to be led by your spirit. You have to begin to be sensitive to what the spirit of God on the inside of you wants to do. Your flesh will always want to do something fleshly. Your flesh will always want to gratify itself. Your flesh looks in the mirror and says, you're good, baby. You're good. You know, you look nice. Your flesh can see, taste, touch, hear, smell. Your flesh is constantly talking to you. Your flesh consists of your body and it's always telling you it's too hot, too cold, and it wants to be comfortable. I'm going to tell you something, to do things by the Spirit, you may not be comfortable in your body. It may not mean that you can come late to church and get a blessing. Now, if you weren't late, you're okay, but if you were late, you're messing your life up, I'm telling you, by not keeping track of your time. If you can't be on time for God, you won't be on time for business, you won't be on time for work, you'll probably miss airplanes too. And if you treat God so disrespectfully, then how will you treat people? We set this time aside every week that we corporately gather together to worship God. See, and, and, and anytime you're fleshly, you won't do what God says. See, Saul was the picture of flesh. King Saul was the picture of the flesh, the fleshly king. What did he do? He had a prophet come to him and say, listen, Go kill Ag Agag, kill every one of the animals and kill every one of the people. If you destroy all of that, I will establish your kingdom and it'll, be last, it'll, it'll last forever. So what does Saul do? Saul goes into battle, he kills all the people, but he, and he kills all the animals except for the very best of the animals. And he brings the best of the sheep and the best of the cattle and he doesn't kill King Agag. So they bring those things into the camp Saul's getting nervous. The prophet shows up. He says, Saul, why didn't you obey me? Know this, you didn't disobey me. You disobeyed God. Why didn't you disobey? Why did you disobey? Saul says, I did what you told me to do. I did. I did exactly what you said. He says, then what is the bleeding of these sheep that I hear? Oh, no, no. I, 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 the people doesn't take responsibility. Oh, the people, the flesh never takes responsibility. Oh, the people wanted to save the best for sacrifices to God. We're just going to sacrifice. They're all, we're going to kill them, but we're going to sacrifice them. God didn't say sacrifice them. God said kill them. And why didn't you kill King Agag? Oh, the, the, the people wanted to see that we could parade him and, and show off that we won against the king. The people. He didn't take responsibility. He take, he's blaming the people. He's even blaming the prophet. But you said, but you said, you, you, I, 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 I did what you told me to. No, you didn't. See, the flesh never takes responsibility. The prophet turns to him and says, obedience is better than sacrifice. See, that's how many Christians are. They disobey and then they think they can come and give a big offering and God's going to take care of it. They come and they think that just because some prophet gives them a word, they're going to be taken care of. Or just because, you know, God touches you. God will touch you. God will heal you. God loves you. But I'll tell you what, he's more interested in your character and you have to deal with the flesh. And you're only going to deal with the flesh when you begin to walk by the Spirit and the Spirit man is obedient to the Word of God. The Spirit man is obedient to do what God tells him to do. And if you're not going to be obedient, if you're not going to take care of the details, if you're not going to learn to walk by the Spirit, then guess what? You're going to be a fleshly, carnal Christian and you'll not have the benefits of the kingdom. Touch your neighbor. Say, this hurts me. <laughs> yeah, it's your flesh that's crying right now. Your flesh is saying, oh, oh, oh. You don't, this, it, God doesn't care. God does care. And the only way you can overcome the flesh is by the Spirit. Now, how do you know what your spirit man looks like? See, your flesh and your soul, your mind, will, and emotions have feelings. I'm too hot. I'm too cold. That's your flesh. Oh, it's too early. It's too late. Ah, I, I don't want to stand in line. Ah, you know, I don't, I don't like standing for an hour of praise and worship. Oh, that's just too long. 45 minutes is too long. I, I'll just go there after the praise and worship. 
See, your flesh will always sabotage you. Hello? Hmm? Mm hmm? My way? Chokwadi? <laughs> but your conscience, your mind, your will, emotions, and your conscience will also sabotage you. See, your conscience can't be relied upon unless you train it to the Word of God. Some of your consciences have been seared over as with a hot iron. Some of you don't believe what the Word of God says. You just have a conviction about what you believe. See, you train your conscience. Your conscience isn't accurate unless it's trained by the Word of God. Some of you still have a conscience that says it's okay to steal. Especially if it's from a rich person. They owe it to you. Or it's okay to steal from the church because, hey, after all, we're all brothers and, and we're part of a family and I should be able to have my share. It's true. People walk in the bookstore, they think they can steal from the bookstore because, well, bless God, I need that. God will understand. I need the book. Praise God. <laughs> I'll get the blessing from the book and then one day I'll be able to pay it back. I, I, don't, know, I don't know where your thinking's at, but it's the flesh. It's, 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 not, it's not obedient. Tap your neighbor and say, I think I know that person. <laughs> I think, no, that, but those, that's your flesh, and that's an uncontrolled flesh. And see, the flesh, even, your, even your, your mind, will, and emotions is constantly talking to you from the outside. It's telling you what you feel, what you think. But you see, the difference between the flesh and the spirit is that your, your flesh has feelings. It has emotions. It can be moved very easily by what you feel, you sense, you, you desire, you want. You, you, and, and it's very, very enticed. It's very sensual. But the spirit doesn't have any feelings. Your spirit man feels nothing. So if you're, make, if you're having lots of feelings, I'm not sure that's the spirit. That doesn't mean that when the spirit of God touches you, you don't feel something. But if you need a feeling to obey God, I'm going to tell you something, you're deceived already. See, the spirit man looks into the law of liberty. The Bible says that the spirit, if you want to know what your spirit looks like, you look as into the word of God, the law of liberty, which acts as a mirror to you to tell you what you look like. The Word of God tells you who you are, whether you feel like it or not. The Word of God tells you what to do, whether you feel like it or not. Your flesh will always be contrary to what God says. But when you can train yourself to obey God, to do what God says, in spite of what you feel, that's when you become a mature man. That's when you become a spirit-filled, spirit-led man. The spirit is not a feeling. It's not an emotion. It's a knowing. It's an obedience. It's a following after God, regardless of how you feel. It's a cutting off of sin. It's a, it's a determination to do what God says. And when you begin to live that way, now the power of God operates in and through you. Until then, you're going to be moved and taught to and fro by every wind of doctrine by the slight and craftiness of men who will come and they will lead you by the nose. You'll be led by newspapers and newspaper reporters. You'll be led by politicians. You'll be led by whims and, 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 and you'll be led by, by, you'll need a prophet. You'll need somebody to tell you what to do. God never made the locus of control outside of you. He raised you up to be a son of God. He raised you up to take authority. He rose, he, he's causing you to be responsible. And he's given you a dominion that you're responsible for. And all too quickly and all too often, we would rather give it to somebody else. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me. Give me a word. Empty hands on empty heads. Come on. I want you to know. I want you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. I want you to know what the Word of God says. Praise God. So how do you overcome the flesh? As many as are the mature sons of God, they're led by the Spirit. The flesh can only be overcome by walking in the Spirit. And you've got to train yourself. And the spirit is at enmity against the flesh. I can almost tell you exactly how to overcome the flesh. Whatever your flesh is telling you to do, do exactly the opposite. 
Whatever your flesh wants, just turn around and go the other way. That's about exactly how you have to do it. Because your flesh will always lead you to the path of least resistance. Your flesh will always lead you to that which satisfies the flesh. Your flesh will always make you feel good. The Spirit will tell your flesh, shut up! Be still! Do what's right! Your flesh will always make sure everybody's happy. Let's not, ro let's not rock the boat. Let's make sure that everybody's happy. Let's make sure everybody doesn't get upset with me. Oh, praise God. Are you that guy? Everybody okay? <laughs> See, Pastor Tom, just talk nice to us in church. Just tell us what we want to hear. Tell us we're all going to be blessed, blessed, blessed. <laughs> all right, you're all blessed. You're blessed. You're blessed. Do whatever you want to. Do as you will. Do as you please. You're blessed. Just go ahead. God doesn't care. You're blessed. Hallelujah. Live like the devil and think God will bless you, bless you, bless you. <laughs> oh, I see a blessing coming on everybody. A blessing. There's a blessing from heaven. A blessing. A blessing. I see a, oh, blessed, blessed, blessed. I bless you, bless you. Amen. And your flesh says, yeah. Yeah! Oh, I'm blessed! I feel it! I feel it! I'll tell you, I love to feel the power of God. I tell you, I've had the power of God come on me many, many times, and I, and I thank God for it. I've had deliverance in my life. I thank God for that. But you know what? I don't need to have a bunch of feelings anymore. How hard do I have to get you to jiggle and bounce and fall around? You're 20 years old in the Lord. For God's sake, would you grow up? Come on, you're still a baby. You've been walking with God your whole life, and all of a sudden you, you, you need to be jiggling around. You need deliverance? Well, that's just because you're living by the flesh. That's because you have never crucified your flesh. Can I tell you something? You can't get delivered from the flesh anyway. You can't cast out the flesh. You crucify it. See, some of you... I'm not talking to you, but there's people in our city right now, and I'm deeply concerned. Flitting from one thing to the next, no solidity in their hearts, couldn't, stay, couldn't fight through a battle if they needed to. The next flavor of the month blows into town, and they'll be there. People that couldn't even be on time in our church are leaders in another church. I'm saying, are you kidding me? Since when does this take place? I'll tell you, you can do a lot by the flesh. I'm not prepared to compromise the Word of God. It's time for you and I as Christians to take responsibility. It's time for you to take responsibility. We can't keep playing the little church games. You're either going to be a Christian or, and, and live according to Christ. You're either going to crucify your flesh and live in a denial of self that he is increasing while you are decreasing Amen. or you're going to end up in deception. Yes. You're either going to begin to overcome the world by faith or you continue to work by gimmicks. The triple anointing tonight. How can you give three times of what you don't have? I can't give you a double anointing. I can only give you the anointing and a portion of what I have. The double anointing had nothing to do with twice as much of what you have. You can't give twice as much of what you don't have. The double anointing or the double portion was simply the fact that if you had a family of five people, you would cut it into six pieces and the eldest would get two. 
while the others would each get one piece of the pie. And it was called the double portion or the double anointing. And it was simply because the eldest was going to get double because he also had to take care of the responsibilities of the family farm because it was only ceded to one member of the family. Oh, but we make this some stupid thing. You know, come up here, I'll give you double. Double of what? I don't know, my Bible says you have an anointing. Yes. It abides in you. Yes. You have the Holy Spirit, don't you? Yes. How much more do you need than the power of God that already operates on the inside of you? Yes. No, you're looking for something outside and God said it's already in you. Yes. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. Come on. I feel like preaching now. <laughs> but my time's running out. Let me give you my third point. Sit down. You overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. How do you overcome the devil? See, some of you are so afraid of the devil. The devil. The big, powerful devil. The devil's powerful. He is. He's powerful. Don't mess with the devil. I'm going to tell you something. He's powerful. But his authority was stripped on the cross of Calvary. And the handwriting of ordinances that were written against you were nailed to the tree. And he has no authority over you unless you give it to him. So if you're a thief, you've just given the authority of the devil over you. You have given over, the, every time you sin, you give your authority to the evil one. The same way that Adam and Eve, when they sinned, gave their authority to the evil one. That's why God hates sin. God said, I give you all power, all authority over all the works of the devil. But what, every time you violate his word, you give your power to the enemy. The reason some of you have demonic infestation is because of your sins. Hmm. Oh, but I'll tell you what, don't worry, because you can run over across town and get delivered tomorrow night. But see, the problem is, I don't doubt you'll get delivered. But Monday, you'll sin again. And Tuesday, you'll sin because you weren't trained in the Word. You weren't trained how to overcome. You weren't trained how to resist the devil. How did Jesus resist the devil? Jesus, yeah, you guys know because I taught this, but the, the rest of them don't know yet. Jesus overcame the devil when he was anointed in the waters of baptism it says the Holy Spirit came down upon him like a dove and God spoke out of heaven and said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased and when he came up out of the waters the anointing was upon him and immediately the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days and 40 nights by the devil oh you want to be anointed right oh I want the anointing great you know what that opens you up to temptation the minute the devil sees an anointing on you, he's coming after you. You say, well, I'm anointed by God for business. Yeah, get ready for an attack. Get ready for your business to come under attack. Dedicate your business to the Lord. Dedicate something to God. Put an anointing on it and watch what the devil does. He's coming after you. Let me tell you something. He's going to come after the anointing on you. He's going to come after because he's got to stop you. Jesus, anointed of God. And the devil says, I'm after you. The Bible says after 40 days of fasting and prayer, eating and drinking nothing, the devil came to him and said, two-thirds of the devil's language is if. If you are the son of God, <laughs> if you really are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are, if, if, if you're really a man of God, turn these stones into bread. Can you hear the hiss of the serpent in that? <laughs> if I am the Son of God. What does Jesus do? 
He turns to the devil, he said, it is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. She, it is written. But the devil doesn't stop once. He says, okay. He says, let me show you something. Taking it up to a high pinnacle of the temple, he says, let me show you all the kingdoms of the world. Oh, he says, no, he says, he says, let me, he says, throw yourself down from here. He says, if you are the son of God, don't you know that the Bible says, the Bible says, that you can cast your, that he will give his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. What did Jesus do? He turned to that devil, he says, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Amen. 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 Oh, glory to God. Then finally he takes him up and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. He says, if you'll just bow down and worship me, <laughs> just worship me. He says, I will give you these kingdoms. I'll give you the world. See, Jesus, though, had come to save the world, not conquer it, not own it. But the temptation was real. He was going to gain through illegitimacy what God had already given him legitimately. But he would have been able to avoid the cross. He would have been able to avoid crucifying his flesh. He would have been able to avoid so much. He would have been able to avoid his flesh being hurt. He would have been able to avoid all the, he would have been able to have all the worldly pleasures. And he would have been able to succumb and be under the devil. And we would have all been cursed and gone to hell. But instead, Jesus turned to the devil. He looked him in the eye and he said to the devil, get out of here. It is written. And the Bible says that the devil departed him from him. He departed from him till he could come back at a more advantageous time. The devil's coming back, don't worry. And it says angels came and ministered to him. Can I tell you something? God wants angels to minister to you. He sends angels to be ministering spirits to his people. But you know what? They only minister after you won the battle. When you fight temptation, you feel like you're about to die. The temptation is real. But you must overcome temptation. You must overcome the devil with the word of God. It is written. Say it out loud. Say it again. No, no, come on, say it like you mean it. No, all of you, up in the balcony, come on. Say it again. It is written. How do you overcome the world? By faith. How do you overcome the world? By faith. How do you overcome the world? How do you overcome the flesh? By walking in the spirit. How do you overcome the flesh? How do you overcome the devil? It is written. Say it again. It is written. Say it again. It is written. Now, here's the problem with most of you. You don't know what's written. So you'd rather have a prophet. Yay! Thus saith the Lord. And I don't mind that. But it keeps you weak, it keeps you under, it keeps you attracted to something besides who you're supposed to be. Amen. Run to some healing meeting. Yeah, go get healed. Go. And next week, next month, would you need to be healed again? When you're sick and, and there's no prophet around, there's no healer around? You can't fly to Nigeria? Hey, listen, I'm dealing with people that come back from Nigeria right now. They spent fortunes to go get their healing. Now they come back disillusioned. 
Why? Because they're still sick. I'm not saying that God's not healing. I believe God's a great healer. I believe that God will heal you. But you can't have four small houses, HIV, be as corrupt as can be, and then think you can just go to some man of God and everything's going to go away. You've got to repent. Repent. Zacchaeus. 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 When he met Jesus, was despised and hated. He was a thief. He was the tax collector. He had stolen money from everybody. And what did he do? He says, I'll pay back four times. He says, I'll give half of my ownings. He says, I'm going to get rid of it all. He says, because I know I, but he says, so, and, and Jesus says, now I know salvation's come to your house. Amen. Here's what it bothers me. We got people that walk the aisle, they give their life to Jesus and nothing changes. They go out and they're just as big a crooks as they were before they came down the aisle. I'm not sure you got Jesus. I'm not sure you gave your life to Jesus. I think what you did was, I think you think you have fire insurance. The fact is that to accept Christ means you repent. Sometimes we need to just preach some old fashioned repentance. If you haven't repented of your sins, then what are you doing? If you haven't changed, then I don't know if you really are saved. You're playing some kind of religious game here. I want you to be saved. I want you to be able to have power to overcome the devil, the flesh, and the world. Everybody say, I can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. I overcome the world by my by my, I overcome the flesh by walking in the Spirit. By walking in the Spirit. By being led of the Spirit. As many as are led of the Spirit, they're the mature sons of God. As many as are led of the Spirit, they're the mature sons of God. As many as are led of the Spirit, as many as are led of the Spirit, tap your neighbor and say, as many as are led by the Spirit, they're just like you. How do you overcome the devil? I like that. Say it again. Let me hear all of you say it. Now I'll tell you what, if you're going to say it is written, you better have chapter and verse. You better have some chapter and verse. That's why you meditate in his law both day and night. That's why you memorize the word of God. That's why you read the daily reading program. That's why we train you, we teach you, we equip you so that you can have all power over the power of the enemy. The Bible becomes your law book. It becomes the, the, the text and the context in which you can take the devil, look him in the eye and say, you can't have it. Why? God said it is written. I tell you something, when you go into a court of law and the judge is sitting there, he says, you've been accused of this, you've been accused of that, you've been accused of this. He say, yes, judge, I know that. I said, but in the case against so-and-so versus the state of Zimbabwe, there is a precedent here that says that you can't try a man for these things that you're accusing me of because the law says you can't touch me. Guess what? That judge, that lawyer, everybody in that courtroom can't touch you because you have a law that protects you. Can I tell you something? It's not God that's the legalist, it's the devil. So when you can stand up and you say to him, ah, it is written. Yes, I know you're tempting me, even using the scripture, but the word of God by the spirit of God says, it is written, you can't have me. Amen. When sickness comes and attacks your house, We've got to run to the prophet. Is that right? Well, you do. You go ahead. Me, I just take out my law book. I take out the word of God. And I say, Satan, it is written. By his stripes, I am healed. Satan, it is written. Healing is the children's bread. Satan, it is written.
Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who healeth all thy diseases. How many scriptures on healing can you quote? He takes sickness from the midst of us. He'll put none of the diseases that he put upon the Egyptians, upon his children. Come, come on, what, what, what do you know of the word of God? How do you stand against the temptation? How do you stand against the attack of the devil unless you can quote what God says? Know what God says. Know what your Savior purchased. Know what God did for you. Many Christians don't know the Bible. They don't study the Bible. They have no love for the word. They don't know the word. Many know about the word, but they don't know the word. They can quote a few cliches. Who greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world? But they don't believe it. He comes at me one way and flees before me, seven. I'm the head and above, above and not, I'm the head and not the tail, but above and not beneath. Yeah, yeah, cliche, cliche, cliche. It's not what you say, it's what you believe. If you can believe in your heart and say to a mountain to be removed and cast in the sea, that's, that mountain will be thrown into the sea.